Good morning, everybody. My name is Megan Butler, and I'm an innovation associate with the Jewish Healthcare Foundation, along with being a member of the Liftoff PGH team. We are thrilled for our session this morning, featuring two really wonderful speakers. Um, it should be a really fun session. And the topic for today's session, Games for Health, was really inspired by this question that our team had about whether or not we could use gamification to really improve health outcomes specifically. So we're very excited to hear from our two speakers. Um, before I introduce our two speakers, I also wanted to shout out the fact that we actually do have a game that we've implemented as a part of Liftoff PGH that we actually worked over the past year or so with Carnegie Mellon's Entertainment Technology Center to develop. Um, so if you haven't checked out that game, I would highly recommend everybody take a few minutes to do so. Um, I can include the link to it in chat, um, but it's go.liftoffpgh.org. Um, and the game provides customized recommendations for different um, experiences that we're offering throughout the Liftoff PGH Summit over the next week or so. Um, so with that, I'd love to introduce our two speakers. Our first speaker will be Dr. Jessica Hammer, who is the Thomas and Lydia Moran Assistant Professor of Learning Science, jointly appointed to the HCI Institute and Entertainment Technology at Carnegie Mellon University. Um, and in, in addition to that, she's an award-winning game designer, including winning the National Shape of Health competition with her game Frolic. Um, and following Jess will be our second speaker, Jesse Shell, who is the CEO of Shell Games. And since starting Shell Games in 2002, Jesse has grown it into the largest full service educational and entertainment game development company in the United States. Um, and that's located right here in Pittsburgh. So thank you again, everybody for joining us today. Um, with that, I would like to hand it over to our first speaker. Hi there. Um, let me thank you for that lovely introduction. Let me just uh, share my screen. I've got some slides today. Uh, so um, my, uh, uh, my name is Jessica Hammer and uh, uh, I'm the co-director of the OLAB um, at Carnegie Mellon University. And I wanted to talk a little bit about um, our work on health games. And uh, we are a research lab, but we actually were also kind of a small game design studio, nowhere near the scale of Shell Games. But one of the things that is really important to us is that we look at things both from the perspective of researchers and game designers. Um, and this uh, influenced our approach to games for health. Because if you want to think about, right, things that are games that are not related to health or things that are health interventions that are not related to games, what we care about um, are actually, we want to be able to look at good games, right? So games from the point of view of craft and excellence of craft, games that are uh, what we might call worth, worth their player's time. And at the same time, looking at this from a research perspective, we want to make sure that we're thinking about this from the perspective of research-backed health um, perspectives, whether that's methods of intervention or um, uh, whether that's identifying problems that are, are sort of consequential and serious based on the research. And of course, uh, what we want to embody by being in this intersection is being able to see, sort of look from both these perspectives at the same time. Uh, so together with my colleague, Lauren Wilcox, we sort of said, hey, wouldn't it be great to have a, a, like a database, a list of games that sort of fit our criteria for being games that are both exceptional as games and that are sort of based on validated health behavior theories and that really embody research in some way. So it turned out that what we mostly found was we found some things that were good games, but didn't really embody any health uh, theory. We found a bunch of things that embodied health theory and were not really great games, were not particularly fun to play. And almost everything we found was actually out here right, in the, the sort of not so good on either front um, uh, uh, category. And this was really surprising to us, right? You know, Sturgeon's Law, right, 95% of everything is not that great. But um, uh, it, was, it was really surprising to us how little we were able to find that fit our criteria. And that motivated us to start looking at the question of why, why does this happen? Why is it so hard to make good games for health? So we went out and we did a study with stakeholders. We figured we could look at 
people who were game designers, people who were health behavior researchers, and also people with perspectives. Um, if you're interested in uh, everything we found, we have a research paper, the citations down there at the bottom right. But just to give you one example, we found some pretty fundamental differences in how these three groups thought about making games and about the relationship between health and games. So for example, game designers really thought that games and health concepts had to be tightly integrated, usually through game mechanics and game narrative. Health behavior researchers thought of games as something that represents the health domain, right? So it was like, let's make a good representation of this underlying model. While people from the games for health space really thought about it as games being experienced that drove health behaviors outside the game. And we found a sort of a whole range of challenges like these that make, um, that, that maybe explain why it's difficult to have both excellent game design and excellent health research in the same experience. So we thought, great, one thing we can do is figure out better ways for domain experts and game designers to work together better. We figured that the best way to do that was start to eat, eating our own dog food and working in this area. So this is really our aspiration. Um, and I wanna talk to you today about some of the things that we're doing uh, uh, sort of within this space. So our approach is to look for um, sort of appropriate problems. Not every health problem is, is appropriate to address with a game. Um, we base things in rigorous um, peer reviewed research. So we really kind of start with this idea of what is the mecha mechanism of change or what kinds of research might we build this on. We strive for excellent craft in game design, interdisciplinary collaboration from day one. Um, and finally, we work with real world partners. So ultimately we like to make games. We like to do research on games. We're, our thing is not so much game distribution or game marketing. So we actually really like to work with partners who are gonna take the work that we do and who are gonna put it into practice um, beyond the lab. Because if we think if we're making games that matter that they should go out there and, and, and have an impact, even if that's not what we specialize in. So I'll give you an example of something that we did um, with Philips Health. We call this the, the Sleepy Games Project. At some point, it will probably get uh, a fancier name, but uh, right now it, it's kind of what it says on the tin. Uh, we were talking to Philips about uh, sort of the consequential health challenges that they try to address. And one of them is 70% uh, of American adults face issues around sleep, almost always not getting enough sleep. And there's a whole range of sort of uh, underlying reasons for this from sociocultural norms around sleep and work um, to uh, social constraints like what shift people are working to underlying health conditions like depression or anxiety. Um, but given just how many people this affects and how serious the impacts of um, uh, 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 sleep deprivation are on people. I mean, it's like, you know, driving with sleep deprivation is worse than driving drunk, and yet we do it all the time. Um, we thought that this was an area that we could help Philips explore. Um, and so we asked this question of how games can support healthy sleep. And through our research, which I, I don't have time to detail today, we came up with sort of seven areas where we thought that games could provide something um, to the question of how do you design sleep interventions, um, that sort of uh, uh, drew on the unique features of what made games awesome. Uh, so I'm gonna walk through an example. Uh, we're gonna talk about three of these themes today and I'm gonna show you an example of one of the games that we prototyped that helped us start to answer this question. Um, so the game in question is called Office Shots. Um, you'll see here, this is a non-digital prototype of the game. Um, and it's a game that you're taking into the workplace. So it's located at your job and you're playing it while you're at work. Um, and I'll come back and talk about how the game works in a minute. But Office Shots is meant to address three of these key sort of areas of value that games can bring to sleep. First of all, there's the question of agency and control. Uh, I'm sure many of you have had the experience of trying to fall asleep when your body does not want to sleep. 
you simply cannot make yourself fall asleep on demand, right? Sleep can be facilitated, but not controlled. And what's more, trying to control your sleep can actually be so stressful that it makes you unable to sleep. Um, social embeddedness is that people think of sleep as a solitary activity because you're not conscious of other people when you're doing it. But in our research, we found that actually other people care about your sleep a lot. You're constrained by other people's actions in terms of how you can sleep, like if someone is making noise in the next room or your child is crying. And how and when you sleep also can send social messages. For example, we talked to people who were underslept specifically because they did not want to miss out on time with family or to make their family feel like they weren't valued. Um, and finally, people make sleep related choices all day and they generally aren't always aware of the choices they're making throughout the day that affect sleep. So with these kind of three themes in mind, Office Shots is trying to tackle um, this question of how do I behave at work during the day when I'm not sleeping, I'm not trying to sleep, and I'm under social pressure to appear like a good worker, and yet how do I reduce my caffeine intake, right? So um, you'll see here, we're going to talk about some pieces of this game. There's a box into which um, people are dropping these coffee tokens. You can see the coffee tokens, little coffee cup tokens. Um, there are challenge tokens that you can use to challenge your coworkers. And there are um, cards here in the middle that are about um, representing uh, different kinds of things that you can do to replace the boost of energy that drinking coffee gives you. So the overall goal was, can we facilitate caffeine reduction during the day? We know that that helps people sleep better at night, right? Research backed, lots of evidence for it. Um, and so our game takes four, explores four sort of ways of doing this. First of all, every morning, everyone who's playing the game gathers around the coffee machine in the office, which is where that little box that you saw sits. Um, and they decide how many tokens they each want to take during the day for how many cups of coffee they plan to have. And um, this sets kind of a social norm in two ways. First of all, it sets the norm that we think about how much caffeine we consume, right? It's not, oh, I'm going to drink so much coffee that makes me a great worker. Um, but it also um, helps people norm like, oh, I didn't know you drink like five cups of coffee during the day. Wow, okay. Gives people an excuse to understand what, what is normal and appropriate in their environment. People have to drop a token in the box every time they drink a cup of coffee, which reduces uh, sort of the automaticity of the behavior. We just literally wanted to create a little bit of friction to cause people to think before they drank caffeine. We wanted to raise awareness of alternatives. So if you run out of tokens, you can always get another token by challenging someone else who's playing the game. Uh, you do a little, you pick a challenge card from the deck, you do the activity together, and then you're allowed to go and have another cup of coffee. Um, but all of these challenge card activities are things that increase physiological arousal without caffeine. So the physiological effects of caffeine are things like raising your heart rate. Um, well, it turns out there's lots of ways to do that, from doing 10 jumping jacks to um, uh, doing breathing exercises. So we researched a bunch of these things, again, that already exist in the literature. No one does them um, because they're awkward or inconvenient. And that's the last thing is that we kind of had the game as an alibi to be able to do these things in the workplace. Like I'm not the weirdo doing jumping jacks to like wake myself up. No, 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 we're playing a game. And the game also served to give people permission to take breaks. So actually a lot of the reason people were drinking coffee during the day was as a socially acceptable way of stopping work, right? Of saying, oh, you know what? I'm just gonna take a break. I'll go get a cup of coffee. This actually is very common for people who smoke as well. And so the game created a space in which people could say, I'm going to take a break, and they could do something that wasn't drinking coffee. Now, this all sounds great, right? But how does it work? So we actually did a field study where we put this game into um, uh, three different workplaces, and we had people play it over the course of several days, and it was totally voluntary, right? We didn't say, you know, you, you know, you have to play this or you're rewarded if you play this. Uh, they basically got compensated for 
uh, having it in their workplace and then being interviewed afterwards about whether they did or didn't play. Nonetheless, we had an incredibly high level of voluntary engagement. We had 11 out of 12 people playing our games. Um, we found that it increased their reflection and self-awareness about their caffeine consumption during the day. And they all reported behavior change. Everyone who played reported that at least one decision differently because this game was in their space. And finally, they reported these incredibly positive social interactions within our workplace, within their workplace, even when people were not, even with people who were not playing the game. So people who were not playing the game would say, ooh, what's that? Oh, a token, a coffee token, cool. Maybe I'll show that, show up and try that tomorrow. Like, what a great idea, I would love to sleep better. And so it facilitated these conversations about sleep actually around the coffee maker. Um, and you can read more about that in the, the sort of research paper that we wrote about this and some of the other prototypes that we created. And just to give you a sense, we actually were able to put together an amazing team of faculty, CMU staff, Phillips folks, and we had a large number of students. What I've actually shown you is just one of uh, uh, 15 prototypes that we created over the course of a year and a semester, so almost a year and a half, and did some research with. So we actually have a lot of work, more work in this area. I just wanna give you a taste of it today. Um, and I also wanna give you a sense of like, all right, well, so what? Um, how does this work in terms of our relationship with our partners? So in this case, Phillips came to us, they had this really exploratory question like, how can games support healthy sleep? What should we even be investing in? They weren't ready at that point to um, sort of start generating designs. Um, so we kind of said, yeah, we would love to help you define what might be possible and what might be valuable. So we actually have three outcomes of this. We sent a bunch of research insights back to Phillips. We're disseminating our work to the research community because we think there's value for other researchers and other game designers to be working in this area. And we're also applying for further funding to develop some of our most promising ideas. Like for example, games that help the parents of small children make bedtime go more smoothly. As it turns out, a lot of interest in that one. Uh, my daughter just turned five, so we got some personal personal play testing there. Um, but we have other models for the kind of work that we do and how we sort of um, disseminate it and and put it into practice. So, for example, we're currently working on a project called All of Us that's working with um, the NIH and their library partners to help people who have. Uh, from groups that are marginalized by our healthcare system. So people who have bad experiences with healthcare, for example, because of racial bias or because of their gender presentation or because they are transgender. Um, and basically working with them to help support their health literacy and help them make good health decisions in the absence of a trusted relationship with a doctor. And so um, they came to us with a pretty well-formed idea. We're making a game. We're going to um, send that game back to be actually used in practice. So we're making a, you know, a deployable version for the libraries. We're also doing research with it, right, based on the underlying theories we're putting into place about, for example, how do you generate trust? How do you create a sense of self-efficacy in players? And that research is going to go back to the NIH so that they can design their own programs based on what we learn. A third model is um, with partners at Duquesne, um, we uh, found out about this uh, um, Office of Women's uh, Health o Award, and no one asked us to do this, but we thought it was cool. How could we make something that's really different in the space of supporting girls' physical activity? So we made a game prototype kind of on spec just because we thought we could do a great job, submit it for the award. As it turns out, we won and um, we're publishing on it now. And um, we also have released our game uh, available for free on um, iOS. Uh, you can download it, it's called Frolic. And we are applying for um, uh, uh, funding to actually sort of continue working on this game in a maybe more commercial context. And so we're looking at, for example, like SBIRs and other sorts of mechanisms to just have this game 
disseminated because as it turns out, the people who are using it are finding it even more valuable in the pandemic than we had originally planned, which is pretty neat, right? When you do something that's cooler than you think. That's sort of the high level of what I wanted to share to you, right? So how we um, integrate research and design to answer these bigger questions that, um, you know, we no one knows the answer to yet, as well as to make games with partners who have a pretty good idea of what we want. Um, we love to share what we know. So there's my email address. Thanks for your time. And I'm looking forward to discussing during the Q&A. I'm just going to give it a so sec much. to, if you want to write down my email address. <laughs> we can also post it in the chat. Oh, perfect. OK, Good I'll stop that. sharing then. Thank you. <laughs> no worries. Thank you so much, Jess, for that great presentation. Um, like Jess said, we do have time for Q&A at the end of the session today. So if you have any questions that pop up as you're listening to the presentations, please feel free to go ahead and type those in chat or in the Q&A panel, and we'll make sure to address as many of those as possible at the end of the session. But with that, I'd like to hand it over to our second speaker, Jesse Shell. So whenever you're ready, Jesse, go ahead and take it away. And I, there you go. All right, uh, looks like I should be all set here. Great, uh, yeah, hi everybody, I'm Jesse Shell. I'm the CEO of Shell Games. I also uh, teach at the Entertainment Technology Center uh, along with Jess Hammer. Um, uh, so I've been there for maybe about uh, 18 years now and also running uh, Shell Games, which is a studio here in Pittsburgh with about 130 people. And we do a wide variety of things. I've got a little video that kind of gives an overview of the studio. So I'll show you that. Shell Games is not your typical game studio. With our long history in the game industry, we are uniquely positioned to create interactive experiences that engage and inspire players of all ages across all platforms. Our portfolio includes projects ranging from mobile games to virtual reality games to interactive installations to theme park attractions and everything else in between. As a leader in virtual and augmented reality, Shell Games is capable of leveraging these powerful new technologies to create immersive experiences that educate, entertain, and engage. We are always ready to experiment with the latest technologies and the newest techniques. Not only are we different, we are experienced. Since 2002, our award-winning studio has worked with world-class clients and partners in diverse industries, including toys and games, healthcare, technology, education, and entertainment. As the largest education and entertainment game development company in the U.S., our team of over 100 people is committed to bridging the gap between educational and entertainment games to develop experiences that surpass our clients' expectations. Our diverse staff is a seasoned group of artists, designers, animators, engineers, producers, and audio professionals who create games with purpose and with pride. Shell Games. Amazing teams, amazing experiences, amazing fun. Yeah, so there's an overview of kind of what we uh, what we do. Uh, our business model is uh, pretty simple. We work in four different markets that I'll talk about uh, in a minute. We tend to favor very sort of tech forward projects. And uh, so we, we do client work, we try and make it profitable, and then we invest those profits in some of our own initiatives. The four main markets that we focus on are theme parks and museums, educational games, health games, and home gaming. Uh, today, I was gonna give an overview of uh, some of our work in the realm of health games. When we do health games, we, uh, just like when we do educational games, we you have a certain process that we use we refer to as the transformational game design process we often talk about games being transformational because the focus that we have is on how does the game change the player for both educational games and various kinds of health games that's really the thing that we want to focus on what is the change that we we want to see in the player so we have this process which you know there's a lot of details here for for people who want to check out the slides later um, but it's all about figuring out what's that change we want to make, how can we best bring it about, 
and then going through a process of game design that's really going to optimize the game to meet those goals. So we've created a, a number of different kinds of health games. Um, one interesting one that we created with UPMC is uh, something called Odyssey. If anybody has UPMC insurance, you can download this app. And it has a lot of different facets to it. It has stress management, and it has uh, if you need to stop smoking, and if you're, uh, if you're working on weight loss, it has a lot of different systems of virtual coaches that will guide you through various exercises. And just as a small example of the way we try and integrate research into we had learned about, was that when people have the agency to choose the appearance of a virtual coach, they are more likely to pay attention to what that coach says. So since our coach was virtual, we had no real reason to design like one coach. So we made a collection of different uh, coaches that uh, will guide you through the experience. And so you get to pick the one you like and you can even change it partway through um, if that's something you're interested in. And then the way the experience works is it sort of works through simulated texting because we were thinking a lot about how do you take um, how do you take all this health knowledge, which is normally presented in the form of a workbook or a video series, how, how are we going to present that in a phone that's going to make sense? And we realized that, well, well people are used to texting on their phones all day. Why not um, have this work in that same uh, interaction mode. And so the virtual coach kind of has these, these texting type conversations with you. And we found it was very effective at engaging people, getting people to sort of stick with the program and, uh, and absorb the, the information. Because when information is absorbed in lots of little pieces, it, can, it often, because it's over a longer period, uh, can be absorbed a lot better than if it's all brought to you in one big chunk. Another really interesting project we worked on was something called uh, Night Shift, which was uh, proposed by Dr. Deepika Mohan, uh, also at UPMC. And this was a, a fascinating project because she had previously worked to create a simulation to help emergency room doctors deal with trauma situations. And uh, unfortunately, the initial simulation was not very effective. Um, there, there's a problem in trauma situations. There are choices that doctors have to make rarely and they don't get very good feedback about those choices. And so they tend not to get better. So the concept of the original project was, could, we, uh, could, could, could someone create a, a simulation that just gave doctors practice? And what she found was practice wasn't enough. Practice wasn't enough to actually change behavior. And so the goal of night shift was to give doctors practice, but give it to them in an emotional context with the idea that the emotions that you experience um, from interacting with the characters in the game, from seeing the consequences of when things go wrong, those emotions might better cement in behavior change. And uh, there was a, a test that proved that it was pretty effective. We've got a video uh, explaining that, so I'll show you that here. To err is human. However, when physicians make mistakes, the consequences can be severe. Medical diagnosis requires physicians to integrate complex information from multiple sources. Under normal conditions, that process requires the use of heuristics, intuitive judgments, or mental shortcuts. When calibrated well, heuristics allow rapid, accurate decisions. However, when calibrated poorly, they produce errors in judgment. Many interventions have tried to reduce reliance on heuristics. However, in doing so, they ignore the potential power of these cognitive processes. We set out to develop an intervention to recalibrate physician heuristics during diagnosis, focusing on the special case of trauma triage. In the US, severely injured patients are supposed to be treated at trauma centers. Triage can happen either in the field or after evaluation at a community hospital. Only one half of patients are triaged appropriately, in part because of the influence of heuristics. The problem is interesting because physicians have to triage patients quickly and with limited information. Also, most physicians in the community see severely injured patients infrequently. 
they see 1,000 patients for every one with severe injuries. These conditions make it difficult to learn best practice decision principles. We developed a video game in collaboration with Shell Games to serve as the intervention. The game uses stories to communicate decision principles. Players take on the persona of Andy Jordan, a young emergency medicine physician who takes a job in a local ED. As players complete the game, they gain experience with the consequences of diagnostic errors and trauma. We recruited 368 physicians, randomized them to play the game or to use traditional educational applications, and then measured triage decisions on a virtual simulation. Six months later, we asked a random sample of 200 of these physicians to use the simulation again. We found that physicians who use the game made 11% fewer diagnostic errors when triaging trauma patients compared with those who use the experience which persisted at six months. Key limitations included a convenient sample of physicians and the use of a virtual simulation to measure outcomes. Although we detected a large effect, the magnitude and real-world efficacy of the intervention are unclear. However, our results suggest that narrative-based video games have the potential to influence physician behavior. So yeah, so that's Night Shift. It was a, a fascinating project uh, to work on. Uh, very interesting to try and find a way to balance uh, this sort of story-based game that involves a, kind of a, a, this drama of this doctor kind of returning to his hometown and trying to resolve his relationship with his grandfather. Uh, and at the same time, this, the, this drama from his real life kind of spills over into his relationships in the hospital. And we found that this mixture of, um, of, of story combined with real diagnosis made for a, a really interesting and engaging game that was, that was different than I think doctors had encountered before. One of the big challenges for us was playtesting it was challenging because uh, the people working on it, we're not doctors. And so there are parts of the game we couldn't really play without like a big hint sheet about exactly how one properly, uh, you know, uh, di you know, deals with uh, the data that's coming in and, and diagnosing. Uh, for people who want to find more about that, there's, uh, there's a published paper um, that, you can, uh, that you can check out from the uh, British Medical Journal. Um, Last game I wanted to talk about was uh, Play Forward. Uh, this was a game that we worked on with uh, Yale Medical. And it was it's all about uh, helping uh, young uh, teenagers uh, make good decisions that will uh, prevent HIV. So here's a short video explaining that. Play Forward Elm City Stories serves as the foundation for the Play to Prevent Lab. Play Forward is a 2D mobile-ready video game designed to provide at-risk young teens the opportunity to acquire and practice skills to reduce their risk for HIV and STI infection. In the game, the player creates an aspirational avatar and travels through their life, facing challenges and making decisions that bring different risks and benefits. Players have the ability to see how their decisions affect their life and subsequently are able to move back in time to see how different actions might have led to different outcomes. Data generated from the game allows us to track the player's actions. Using these data, we can evaluate in real time how our players are acquiring skills to help them make better choices. Play Forward was developed using evidence-based concepts from prominent behavior change theories, including self-efficacy, social norms, message framing, and delayed discounting. Input from youth and community members helped us to shape the stories, characters, and artwork for the game. This was one of the my favorite parts of uh, working on this project was it was very important that the uh, the world seem really realistic to the teenagers because teenagers are notoriously uh, judgmental about the way things look and they're quick to reject things that don't look right that don't seem authentic and so part of the way that we made that work was we uh, had uh, a group of our uh, a group of teenagers that were going to be testing the game we had them take pictures of their lives and, and give them to us. And we use those as the, uh, as the inspiration for the artwork in the game. And it really helped with the uh, acceptance uh, of the game. So a game like this is, uh, can be pretty complicated. We often do game design. Part of how we do it is we, we like to create these 
sort of uh, single sheets, this sort of a poster that says, look, okay, here's all the elements of the game sort of laid out. And there are a lot of them in this game because we were trying to do multiple things at once. And, and I, I wanna talk about this a little bit because this, this is an important way that uh, to make transformational games effective is to not have them just try and do one thing, but to often have them try and do multiple things simultaneously. So we have about eight things that we try and do in, uh, in Play Forward. One of them is we try to get the player to visualize their ideal future. Now you might say, well, what does that have to do with you know, preventing HIV? And there is research that shows that teenagers who are future oriented make safer, less risky decisions than teenagers who don't believe in their own future and are just focused on the present. And so the game begins by asking you to, um, to it asks you a lot of questions about, you know, imagine yourself when you're 25, tell me about your life. What would you like it to be? Like, what kind of house would you like to have? What, what kind of job would you like to have? What kind of relationship would you like to have? And so they, they, they answer these questions. And then we say, hey, you know what? Funny thing, we know somebody who had all of these same goals. And um, we want to tell you about their story. And so we get them to visualize that and think about like what it is they want. So that helps bring them there. But then we say, oh, but unfortunately her story went really badly. Um, her story, like, man, it ended, up, it ended up terrible. And then the idea of the game is let's go back through her life. And now let's, uh, let's see how we can make changes in her life. What could she have done differently? that would have actually made the real changes in her life. And uh, exposing them to the consequences um, of, of the behavior and just sort of seeing, you know, what happens when you make certain decisions, obviously that's, you know, those are stories that can kind of stay in someone's mind and help change their behavior. Another thing was kind of focusing on the question about what is and isn't dangerous. So we had some kind of mini games in there that were all about trying to analyze different things that uh, that friends might say and trying to figure out like, well, wait, is that true? Is that not true? What, what is safe? What is not safe? And then another important idea is to give them practice examining situations to identify the danger in a situation. So part of the way the game works is we rewind this character's life back to um, uh, seventh grade. And of course, here we see Leela, but there's there's female characters, there's male characters, we have characters of different races in here, because we really wanted people to identify with uh, the character that, um, that they're going to follow. And uh, you're going to go on a journey with them from seventh grade up to 12th grade, and you're going to see these different adventures that they had. And one of the things that's very effective about this is students are, you know, students of that age, young teenagers are very interested in lurid stories about things that happen to people older than them. So this is immediately engaging to them. But part of what we want them to do is to practice um, examining a dangerous situation. So we put them in these situations, like situations where you might be at a party, and instead of just saying, oh, this happens, now make a decision about what to do, there's, there's a lot of elements of the game that are about, hey, look around this situation. What are the things that look a little suspect? Hey, there, there's that kind of dazed kid sitting on the floor. What could that mean? And so the game is very much encourages you to sort of stop, examine situations, and look for what, what are the things here that could potentially be dangerous. And the hope is that by doing that in the game, that maybe they can kind of, they can, by doing it repeatedly in the game, maybe they can bring that habit into the real world. Um, another thing that was important that we saw in research is, under, is had to do with language. That uh, a, one of the ways that young teenagers get involved in situations that could lead to HIV is that they uh, end up hanging out with somebody who is older than them and takes advantage of them. And so part of the concept here is having them get practice hearing and understanding the language of seduction. What the people who wanna persuade you to do something that maybe you don't wanna do, what kind of language do they use? And then what kind of refusal language is effective? So we have these scenarios that you can kind of play through and play out where you, you, uh, you, you practice this and you get to see this and, and analyze it a little bit. 
Social networks are really important in terms of affecting somebody's behavior. It, very often, you know, lots of people have stories of, well, when I started hanging out with these friends, that's when things started to change. So one of the games we put in was all about examining your social network. Who are the friends that you keep close? Who are the friends, who are the people you know, but maybe kind of stay farther away? And how do you decide? And we, we actually thought this game would be challenging to make interesting because it seemed like it was very analysis based and that it could be boring for students. But it turns out this was one of the most popular games in the entire system because the idea of uh, evaluating and judging people was something teenagers, they very quickly jump on that. That's very interesting to them. And the game lets you chat with them. It lets you look at their online social media. It lets you hear rumors of what, what are other people saying about this person. And so this, this became something they were very interested and engaged with. And so it became a great opportunity for us to kind of help underline, here are some of the signifiers of somebody who is more likely to lead you into risky behavior. And then practice with risks and consequences. He understanding about probabilities and, and what they mean. So we created mini games that involve making choices about what to do based on, on risk profile and trying to balance out um, uh, you know, low risks and high risks uh, in your life because you can't go through life without taking any risks. So how can you take the right risks that are going to kind of keep you safe in your life? And then a really important thing is that feeling of stopping something dangerous before it happens. We found that we had ways in the game of making that very rewarding because in the game, basically you're rewinding time you, 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 we, we force you to see the bad thing that happens. We force you down that path. We don't just say, should you do the good thing or bad thing? Everybody knows you should do the good thing. Instead, we say, should you, should you do the good thing or bad thing? And they say, well, the good thing. And we say, mm, sorry, you haven't earned enough experience points to be able to do the good thing yet. You've got to go down the bad path. And we make you go down the bad path and see those terrible consequences. And then you then by learning things through those terrible consequences, you can rewind time, exercise those points, and now try going down the good path. And part of what we try to do is, is show you know, how, how the, the, the good situation ends up. And we're able to simulate these moments where you actually helped a friend um, uh, avert something that was risky and dangerous. And it feels very rewarding in the game. And the hope is very much that by seeing and feeling this in the game, that it's something that um, people might consider carrying over into real life. So there you go, a lot of different transformational methods, many of which are research-based uh, in a single game. Um, and we, we find this is a very effective way to kind of make games strong, partly because you don't know which ones are really going to work. You know, we, we would love to say, we well, you know 100% when we build these games, what's going to be effective. And we, it's experimental. We, we don't always know. But by having multiple different methods at once, if one or two of them end up weak and not really being very effective, and you have others that are strong, well, then you're in a, then you're in a good place. So that's yet another reason to have multiple paths at once. The last thing uh, I'll talk about is uh, one of the new areas we're moving into is uh, virtual reality. Virtual reality has been in our in the entertainment side of our studio. Something that's been it's a real growth area. Something that we've we've been uh, having a lot of success with. And recently we've uh, started working with a company called Penumbra. Uh, they have a thing called Real System, which they're using for. Uh, virtual reality therapy of different kinds. And we are working with them to help them create uh, virtual reality health uh, therapy simulations, which is really proving to be a, a very valuable space because of the way virtual reality lets you bring your body into the simulation. And so many therapies, physical therapy, therapies, but also uh, emotional therapies, um, they really do involving the body and, and using uh, body posturing and body motion in, in order to uh, make these therapies work is, is uh, something that's a real, uh, has a real potential to be very effective. Uh, if people do have more questions about shell games. I mean, we're gonna, we'll do some Q&A right now, but if people do want to reach out, um, feel free uh, to do that. Feel free to send me an email, um, jesse at shellgames.com. Thanks.
Great. Thank you so much, Jesse. It was really yeah. great to hear all of these really unique examples, different examples of ways that um, games can be leveraged to help improve health outcomes. Sure. And Did you want to jump in? To Q and A. Yeah, I yeah. just wanted to say that the fact that um, you know Shell Games and the Olab are both here in Pittsburgh is really kind of an incredible synergy. We really look to Shell Games as an exemplar of what industry can do in doing these kinds of games well. In fact, when we were doing our initial um, search for high quality work, a lot of it was coming from Shell Games. Um, and it also means that we have a trusted partner when we have research insights and we don't necessarily have any way to move forward with it, we can kind of transfer that knowledge um, it sort of uh, internally to people who we know are gonna make excellent games with it. So I just wanna say like, go Pittsburgh. Yeah, no, it is one of the wonderful things about Pittsburgh is the, the synergy we're able to have here between the kind of world-class research that's here and the talent that is in town. It just makes it a, a great place to be able to build things that can really make a difference. Yeah. No, thank right. you so much for pointing that out because so much of the spirit of Liftoff PGH as well is really talking about the region as a whole and what our strengths are. And I think that you're right. This is something really unique that we can say is a strength here in Pittsburgh. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, but we do have a number of questions in the chat and I want to make sure we get to everybody if possible. So we'll go ahead and dive right in um, and folks feel free to chime in with others if um, you have any others. But the first question we've received is what methods would you use to drive engagement with patients who must use body worn devices like masks, headbands or watches? Is there an opportunity to apply game theory to this context outside of the daily challenges and using social networks for comparisons? Uh, so, um, I guess our, uh, we have, we are working on, um, some a AR games, right? And so thing in VR games. So thinking about how we use the body in that way right now, we're not working on a project that's specifically for wearables, but, um, it's interesting and challenging. Um, this actually came up in some of our work on sleep, that when people have a lot of data about themselves, it, there's sort of a sweet spot of people when you, you have like, like, you know, this quantified self data, find it really motivating. A lot of people find it overwhelming and just tune it out. And a lot of people find it really demotivating, right? It's like, oh, I can't control this. And so um, uh, I guess the way I would answer your question is the, the top issue that I think our lab is prepared to address is how do you take that data and change the way people feel about it, make it playful rather than make it overwhelming. Um, and one of our uh, sleep projects actually looked at that. It was using um, uh, uh, basically you would build a Lego representation of your sleep guardian. And then when you had different triggers from your um, sleep data, you would actually change the Lego figure. And you could look at it as this like representation that's tangible and cute and homemade of what feels like an overwhelming amount of sleep data. Um, so we're exploring that piece of it, but there's a lot more to be done. Yeah, I, I think one of the things that can be challenging when, you, when you've got someone who needs so, something, some habit that you need to instill either a long-term habit or even just a short-term habit, like you need to wear this thing every day for three months. Um, uh, it's all about figuring out the barriers. What is it that would stop somebody from doing it? Is it because it's uh, physically uncomfortable in some way? Is it because they don't see the benefit of it? Um, in many cases, these things are implemented in a way that, that is actually emotionally shaming. Um, and there's, and you have to deal with that. I mean, something as simple as I'm going to monitor my weight every day. It sounds simple. It's a good, you know, everyone agrees like, yes, this is a good habit. You know, you should weigh yourself every day if you want to keep an eye on what's going on with your weight. The problem is you, some days your, your weight's not gonna be where you want it to be. And that moment can feel really shaming and it can make you feel like, um, you know, like you're a failure and all these things. And that makes you not wanna do it tomorrow. And that makes you wanna to tune out of the whole process. 
So there are times you're just trying to remind people, hey, don't forget to take your vitamin or whatever, because you just might forget. But then there's other times you've got to work around these barriers that people have and the, and the real emotions they have about how this fits into their lives. And that's, that, that's, that's what it comes down to is, is finding and understanding how do people feel about this and how can I get this to fit into their lives practically and emotionally. All great points. Thank you so much. Our next question is about education specifically. Um, it says, can you speak to educational programs like medical schools beyond those that you've completed research with in regards to adopting gaming or simulation in medical training? I'm curious if you've seen resistance um, for early adopters, and if so, what are some strategies to address this? Well, that, I mean, that's a great question. I, 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 I can definitely say I have not made a big study of uh, the, the processes and procedures used in medical school regarding this. I can say broadly a few things that I've seen is that, uh, you know, it's kind of obvious younger doctors and students are much more embracing of new technologies. It, uh, not surprisingly, we often see uh, older professors, older, older doctors are, are often a little slower to kind of bring, to, to adopt and to recommend these technologies. That all makes sense. That's all just human nature. But um, because the, some of these technologies really can be helpful and let things happen that couldn't happen before, we're seeing them break through in lots of little ways. Um, it, and I, I hate to say the way, the way that really makes the most difference is when it saves money, right? Um, having to actual ha actually have real cadavers is an expensive business. If you can kind of virtualize that and, and have that be more effective, schools are very responsive uh, to that nature. So we, we usually find that the most of the breakthroughs come in ways that clearly uh, save money. And, and of course, I, one thing, yeah, there, um, it's the pioneering instructors are usually the ones who say, look, we're going to try this new thing. We're going to bring it in. And that just makes them more valuable than ever, I think, in uh, educational institutions, because they're going to be the ones that lead an institution to change. Yeah, uh, I just want to, I, I, we, have, we have not done a lot of work with medical schools specifically, but uh, my colleague Lauren Herkus actually works on how instructors choose to adopt new uh, sort of cutting edge technologies. And I think that in concert with the stuff that Jesse is talking about, it might be worth taking a look at her work. Um, I'm not gonna try to summarize it here. It's absolutely fascinating. Uh, and I'll put her name in the chat. Great, Great thank you. Our next question is about data. So the question reads, how do you present compelling data in order to drive patient behavior change? Um, and I think this is an interesting question because data can have many pitfalls. It can be hard to understand. Or I know, Jesse, you mentioned earlier that sometimes the data can be shaming or presented in ways that shame folks. So yeah. um, do you have any thoughts to both speakers about the best ways to use data as a motivating tool for behavior change? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it's all about understanding the relationship that the, the player is going to have with that data. Is it, is it data that they're looking for, data that they're not looking for? Because you can, just the presentation of raw data can often have un unintended effects. A great example is uh, electric companies wanting to get people to conserve electricity started saying, hey, here's the amount of electricity you use. Here's how much your neighborhood uses on average. Well, it's, it turned out that for people who were using more than the average, that was persuasive to them. They would see that and they'd say, oh, I should use less. Look, everyone else is using less. I, I, I don't want to be wasteful. And they would use less. But it turns out the opposite effect. If you use less than the average, it actually motivated people to use more because they say, oh, why, you know, why am I making myself so uncomfortable? Nobody else is. I think I'll use a little more. And so they ended up changing the presentation of the data, not just showing the neighborhood average, but then they would make up some number that was, here's what your green neighbors are doing. And that would be less than you. And because they found that that would motivate people. 
So whatever you do with the data, you've got to get into the heads of the people who are receiving it and understand the social factors and other factors that are that are going to actually change their behavior. Yep, I, I, I strongly agree with that. Data doesn't change people's minds. Um, this is actually research on persuasion has shown this many, many times. People do not make up their minds based on facts. Uh, people make up their minds based on stories. They make up their minds based on identities. They make up their minds based on relationships. Um, and on the one hand, that's extremely depressing. But on the other hand, you can create spaces in which data matters in the context of these larger things that are pervasive to people's lives. So for example, if you evoke someone's identity as, um, you know, I am someone who cares about my community, right? Maybe data about how your, 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 uh, uh, your energy performance becomes relevant. There was actually a fascinating research paper where families would talk about their energy consumption together. Um, and they developed a game that involved kind of going around and, and uh, tagging things in your house and then using them for gameplay. And that what they found was that gave kids a way to say to their parents, hey, you know, this is our future. We need to have a greener household. Um, and so again, it's, it's, and I think this is one of the great strengths of games as a medium is it provides space for data to be a part of a conversation or an emotional relationship. That's great. I think we have time for just one more question. I know we have just a few more minutes here before the session wraps up. This is an interesting question. How will you meet the challenge of competition if AAA studios decide to join the space of um, Games for Health? Um, and I'm guessing we have some folks in the audience who aren't familiar with that term. So maybe if we could also explain what a AAA studio is, that would be great. Yeah, so AAA studios are sort of the big game studios that make the big famous games you've all heard of. Um, uh, you know, Call of Duty, right? Um, uh, but I have to say, from my point of view, they can't compete with what we do. Um, you know, it, we, we are more agile and more deeply embedded in research than e any uh, it, industry R&D department is going to be. We actually, my lab works with a lot of major companies to do this kind of research-driven future vision ideation. And many of those companies have large R&D budgets. So... I, you know, if the AAA studios want to get into it, cool, but they better be calling us if they want to do a good job. One of the big challenges with the Games for Health space is the question of the marketplace. Um, how should these be paid for? Should these be paid for like medicine? Should these be paid for like therapy? Should they just be bought and sold like commercial games in the, in the app store? Um, none of those pre-existing models of payment really fit what these games are. And so as a result, it's a real struggle. There, there are many games that are excellent and helpful, but there's not a way to get people to know about them, use them, try them, and then, and then pay for them in a way that's going to keep the games sustainable. So to, to my mind, if the AAA uh, game studios were getting in there, it would be because there's money to be made. And that would be, that would be great news for the world because it would mean that we have a marketplace where, uh, where, where people are actually willing to kind of pay for and fund these things. Um, so I, I think that would be all good, but I, it's, we're, we're definitely not anywhere near that yet. Great. Well, I'd like to give one last big thank you to both of our speakers today, Jess and Jesse. This was a really great conversation. I hope that everybody on the call today enjoyed it as well. Um, so thank you again to our speakers. Um, I know the contact information for both speakers was included on both the slide decks, and we will be posting those slide decks to the Liftoff PGH portal. So if anybody wants to take a look after the session, you're more than welcome to do so. But we've also posted um, those email addresses in chat, and I see um, Jess just posted hers again. So thank you again to our speakers and thank you everybody for joining us this morning.